We have said that the Word of God is creative, the Word of God is eternal, and the Word of God is prophetic. In other words, it gives us the image of God in this present moment for us. We are going to focus today upon the third chapter of St. John's Gospel. And in that third chapter, the theme will move from light to water, the Holy Ghost. And when you do your exercise this morning after this reflection, go back to the entrance of Genesis and look at the water. Look at and listen for the Holy Spirit. And then go through Exodus and see all of the images that indicate a movement through water, cleansing through water to the new relationship with Almighty God. So this is a pattern that is established. And so Nicodemus, in the very special way, the nightman in the gospel, will be the one who is the retreatant. And then we'll listen to Jesus Christ speak. And we'll see that very often the retreatant is on one level and Jesus is trying to lift him up to another level. And so the gospel of St. John chapter 3. And there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Pharisee, ruler of the Jews, up there. This man came to Jesus by night. Because if he had come by day and anybody had seen why he might be blackballed, you cannot be seen with a resistance because you might be blackballed. Your children might be put out of school. Came by night, incognito, and said to him, Rabbi, we know that thou art come a teacher from God. We know. We they have been discussing our Lord Jesus Christ. They have been talking about him. And now one comes and says, We know you are from God. For no man can do these signs which thou dost unless God be with him. Now the Jew is the nation set apart by Almighty God. The priesthood was established through Aaron and God established the Levites to take care of the holiness and the reverence of the tabernacle. God did everything to make the Jewish people a holy people, the kahal, the priestly people of God. And now we have one upright Pharisee, one leader of the people, saying very clearly, we Jews, we who are in the upper ups, recognize by the signs that you are performing that you are from God. Jesus answered and said to him, Amen, Amen. Every time you hear this in Scripture, Amen, Amen, this is serious theological material. Serious. Amen, Amen, I say to thee, unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God cannot see the kingdom of God. I must be born again. Now, that is what brings Nicodemus to say, what What does this mean, this being born again? And so he says, Nicodemus says to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born again? Physical. Jesus is talking about spiritual. So these levels indicate that people are always going to be approached by our Lord on one level, but he wants them always coming to a new level. Every retreat is a motion from one particular level to a new level. In your life, you're going to find that this call by Almighty God to separate yourself, to enter into a deeper communion with him, will always lead you to a deeper truth. If it does not, it means that you're not being fed. You're reading the wrong thing. You're hearing the wrong thing. Somewhere or another, you're not receiving that which you must have. Your soul plants itself in the soil of eternity. And it knows, just like a seed knows, I need this nutrient, I need that nutrient. And God knows and will place before you exactly the book 
that may be necessary for your spiritual life at this particular time. In which time, because you have been a baptized son of God, in which time that word may come into you and all of a sudden it bears fruit. It allows you to recognize, I am being born again. I'm being initiated into a deeper truth that God wishes to give to me this time. You can never say rest in the spiritual life. The law is non progredi, regredi est. If I'm not seeking to go forward, I am going backwards. And so we must never rest on our laurels. I made a good confession. I'm ready to go forward with Almighty God. You must continue to carry out a plan. And that's what the focus of the next couple days is. Building a plan of life. A plan that you can say, okay, I can adjust this plan, but I have a structure in which I might follow Christ more closely. Jesus answered, Amen, Amen. I say to thee, unless a man be born again of water and the Holy Ghost, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, parallel. Take this in your spiritual exercise. Take that first statement of Jesus. Unless a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Unless a man be born again of water and the Holy Ghost, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You begin to realize we have been baptized. Baptism is an eternal reality. What does change? My understanding of baptism Baptism is an action of God. It is not a temporal action. It is an eternal action. And so, when the Holy Ghost, who gives us the seven gifts of His own choosing, when we are prepared for that particular gift of the Holy Ghost, all of a sudden we find ourselves living more and more in the Spirit of Christ. Breathing, loving, reflecting, all of these actions all of a sudden take on new meaning. And that new meaning is the action of God bringing us into a new life, a constant refreshing of the new life. Now, it may be desolation, but I will read the desolation in the signs of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. It may be consolation. I say, I pray to the God of consolation, not for the consolations of God. I pray to the God of consolations, but not for the consolations. I become completely disinterested in order that I might love without any kind of attachment. And so, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Eternal law. What I sow is what I'm going to reap. If I seek continuously day by day to sow the seed of divine, victimal, sacrificial love, I will reap the fruit of divine, victimal, sacrificial love. Whatever I sow is what I'm going to reap. And that is why our Lord says, if you sow in the flesh, if the world makes sense to you, if money makes sense to you, if your convenience makes sense to you, you will sow in the flesh. And you will reap just simply that. But if you go to the Spirit and sow in the Spirit, you will begin to see things from a divine, eternal perspective. And that divine, eternal perspective is called wisdom. That is a gift of the Holy Ghost. That is why when you hear me pray the Holy Rosary, the first Our Father, I'm always asking our Lord wisdom. Wisdom. To see things from eternity. To make my judgments from the eternal. Wisdom means with God. With Dominum in the Old English. And so, I'm now putting myself with God. Nicodemus, if you put yourself in eternity you will understand that you are being born again. Every de bead on the Holy Rosary is a seed called a seed of perception of truth. That seed 
goes into the womb of our hearts and thus bears the fruit, which is the word made flesh. Our church is a mystical body. Our people are meant to become mystics. And if there's anything that is dragging us down, it's this worldliness, secularism, humanism. We have a structure in the church that sets us up for the mystical life. That structure is called the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Now imagine Anne Barnhart coming to the Holy Mass as a convert, Novus Ordo. And she comes to her first traditional Mass and she says, I'm sitting there following the book because I just I'm, it's completely new for me. I missed everything. The next time I came to that Mass, I said, I'm going to watch that priest. And when she saw that priest bend over with the host in his hands and his arms are on the altar, she says, all of the truths of the Holy Catholic Church flooded me. And I realized, there is the female, the altar, the reception. There is the initiator, the man, who represents Christ. And Christ, the initiator, speaks the word. The word is the seed conceived in the womb of the receptor, Our Lady. And thus, he exposes. Light comes into the world. Light exposes itself to all of those who are the mystical body, and they say what? My Lord, my God. It's a mystical moment. God is there. And there was conception by perception. There is the act that it shows you that you must be a male to be a priest. Not only that is true, but going farther, Jesus Christ is priest and victim. The victim in the Old Testament from the very beginning is a male, unblemished lamb. And here, when John the Baptist, who knows the tradition because he's out of the priestly tradition, and Nicodemus knows the priestly tradition, and Nicodemus was there, and John said, look, the Lamb of God. Firstborn, innocent, unblemished, strong, powerful Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The Hebrew knew they had shepherds over Jerusalem. What did they care for? The flocks of lamb that would be sacrificed for the Passover. And that blood was placed over the doorpost. Go through these images in the Old Testament. You'll begin to have a new appreciation of every moment of the Holy Mass. Mysticism is what we must regain. We must see beyond the normal, the natural, into the supernatural. Then what happens to your prayer life? It rests in the eternal. You don't have to have all kinds of words. You simply have to rest in the arms of love. That's it. And that's why our Lord says then, Wonder not that I say it to you, you must be born again. The Spirit breathes where He will, and thou hearest His voice, but thou knowest not whence He comes and whither He goes. So it is, everyone that is born of the Spirit. You're being born in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is breathing upon you in this retreat. You'll begin to realize that everything past is past. It does not claim any obedience from you. What does claim obedience from you is the truth. Is the spirit that comes to you and speaks to you and you know not where it comes from. You know not where it's going to happen. You could be out here walking the streets praying the simple rosary when all of a sudden the inspiration of the Holy Spirit descends upon you and he answers a question. St. Therese, St. Thomas Aquinas, 
They all follow the same pattern. They begin reading the scripture. They get a difficulty. A difficulty is not a problem, he says, St. Thomas. An obstacle is always an opportunity for God to teach me more. I want more of the divine life. So, I don't understand, Nicodemus says. How can you say the Spirit goes where he willeth? You have the wind, don't you? Do you know where the wind comes from? Do you know where the wind goes? Yet you see it blowing the tree leaves. You know that it's there, but you can't touch it. You can't, in one sense, grasp it and control it. You cannot do that with the Spirit. In the Old Testament, God, you'll see this in the first chapter, God breathed, ruah, ruah, the Hebrew. Just even making that sound, ruah. God breathes out His Spirit upon all creation. And He breathed, ruah, into the first man. And He became a living being. Now, what's happening with you? You're dead because of sin. And all of a sudden, God forgives you. Ruah. He gives you His breath of forgiveness. He breathed upon His apostles and said, Whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven you. He breathed. The Holy Spirit descends. Unless you be born of water and the Spirit, you shall not enter the kingdom of God. Look at what has happened with our people. They live on the level of the senses. No longer is there that joy in life, that scene of God present. My Lord, read the autobiography of a hunted priest and you just see in that autobiography these people who are converted while the whole England is after the priest, ready to kill the priest, destroy the priest, destroy the Catholic faith. And great conversions are taking place. And people are making chapels in their home, hiding places for the priest. And they want the priest. And the priest comes to give them the spiritual exercises. And they have many vocations. The Spirit goes and breathes where He will. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be done? Jesus answered and said to him, Art thou a master in Israel and knowest not these things? The patterns were established, my dear friend, in Genesis, Exodus. The patterns were established. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You are a master you are a teacher of the people and you do not understand the patterns of God. I gave you a pattern of God yesterday. A pattern in the second word, second sword that our Blessed Mother experienced. Every one of you, and I included, I do not separate myself. I am on the same journey you are back to my Father. I must pass through a flight. I just did left everything, came to a new place because this is where God pointed me. Our Lady pointed me. Flight. Detachment. Every bit of work I did for four years. Goodbye. End of story. Thank you, Lord, for letting me do the work. Thank you, Lord, for the good that I know came from it. Thank you, Lord. I wish I could have done much more. Retreats and everything else. I had all kinds of ideas. But... It wasn't meant to be. Now I come here and I say, well, we'll start a retreat for men because men are important in the gift of God to their families. Read Paul Witz's work, Faith of the Fatherless, an extremely important work. He started saying, why are we getting all these dictators, tyrants, why? He began to study and he said, every one of them had either no father or an abusive father. Look at our current president. What did he write about? A non-existent father. Really? The whole point is this. Tyranny comes because they did not know a St. Joseph. They did not know a father who had faith. Because in the same book, Faith of the Fatherless, he then goes to 
the faith of saints. And he finds out every one of these saints has a father who represents God to them. Ah, now we're getting somewhere. So, ultimately, if we are going to choose leaders, we should be choosing leaders who have kind, gentle, knowledgeable, wise fathers. Then, we would have a son who will treat us just as he was treated. Imagine, if you are a master and you do not know the patterns, flight to darkness... I must pass through darkness. I must pass through desolation. I must pass through the cleansing of my life of all that is nothing more than dross. In other words, the fornace, the place of burning, the place in which the gold becomes completely free of any dross. That is a darkness. And yet it brings about a detachment that allows me then to go to more deeply, the love of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father and the Holy Spirit for my soul. Flight, darkness, search for God, attachment to God, then I'm waiting. I'm waiting. What's the next step? Return of everything that you had before. Because if you kept with it, it would keep you away from me. Whatever you hold on to, and you know it by your words, it's always the same thing. Talk about, oh, my car, my this, my that, my heating, my <laughs> whatever it is. In this world, if you were to die in the next moment, who will take care of that? Is it that important? You are masters in Israel. You've gone through the faith. You know the faith. Are you living the faith? Are you being born in the Spirit? Is the Spirit the one who is guiding you day by day in and through the Word of God? As we begin each morning, we are beginning in the Word of God. We begin first with the Holy Sacrifice which unites the Word of God here in this case with St. Raymond of Penafort to the action of God which was to say we must crowd out evil. How do we crowd out evil? By bringing more good. I gave the example in this chapel. I took a glass, remember that glass, and I poured wine into the glass because that's our baptism. That's the life of God, that wine. And here this glass is, and I said, but now, here I come and I choose the world and I take old motorboat oil. I pour the oil into the wine. Does the wine mix with the oil? Can't. Can't. The oil separates There's a complete distinction. Now, the more oil I get, the more I enter into darkness. See? I can't see God through it. How then do I, with this glass and this separation of the life of God underneath and the life of the world on top that seems to be more dominant, how do I get this to increase? Good holy confessions good holy masses, prayer of the rosary, wearing the scapular, all the sacramentals. What happens then? I'm pouring in more and more divine life. So now the wine begins to push what out? The oil. I crowd out. Remember what I said this morning in the Holy Mass, St. Raymond Penafort. If I want to convert my brothers in the Dominican order, I must make a house that is completely pure, completely solid, and saying we're going to follow the traditions of the church. Get it? So important. Crowd out evil. Don't sit there and say, I'm going to be good. Never works. It's pride. Instead say, by the grace of God, by the grace of God, if he desires, he'll take away what St. Paul calls the scallop. Remember, St. Paul had this vision problem and he kept asking the Lord, I've got this scallop, Lord. I want to see. I want to write. Dear Paul, in your weakness, 
my power will reach its perfection. By the Spirit, you know this. I didn't know what to say at my mom and my father's 50th wedding anniversary. I looked at my family I said, what a mess. And I prayed and prayed for six months. I didn't want to go because I was going to be the priest and I would have to say something and I just sit there and I go, wow, 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 what do I say? And then I came upon this and I said, in our weakness, his power can reach perfection. I got it. I got it. I made a poster and put a heart on the poster, an arrow flowing right through the heart like Cupid, right? And out of the heart, I put all the names of the children. I took that there. And as I began the homily, I said, I am not going to tell you that everything is rosy, peachy keen, hunky-dory, that we're all a bunch of saints. We are not. I said, we were, and this is a tear, I sin rips, right? I tore it. We were disobedient kids. Chopped it in half. Two pieces now. I said, uh, we stole. Chopped it again. Now four pieces. We griped and complained about Dad. Cut it again. I kept going with all the sins. It gets smaller and smaller and tighter and tighter until I can't tear it anymore. I call up Doug. Doug, you're big and strong. Come over here. I got more sins. We got to tear this more. He could tear it one more time. Then he couldn't tear anymore. I said, look, we present all this weakness to Almighty God after 50 years and God consumes it in His almighty love and thus we became strong. It's not by proclaiming strength that anyone is brought to Christ. He could have been the strongest of all rulers. He chose to be a what? Crucified worm-like man. You must be born again in the Spirit. You must see things from the mystical perspective so that you no longer get bogged down by the nitty-gritty of relationships and problems in your life. They don't mean a thing. That's why I said to you, when you see the Holy Eucharist, are the accidents changed? No! The substance. Therefore, your body's not going to change much. Your world is not going to change much. The accidents of your life are not going to change much. But your attitude toward them can be changed like that when you allow the Holy Ghost to guide your life. Amen, amen. I say to thee that we speak what we know and we testify what we have seen and you receive not our testimony. You who are masters, you who are Catholics for all these years, you know the tradition of the church. You know what should be left lifted up. We testify, Jesus says. And what word does he use for testify? Martyrion. Testimony in Greek is to shed your blood. A martyr. And so the divine martyr is there and saying, I'm going to testify to what I know. And I know my Father's love. And I know my Father's love for you, Nicodemus. And you must come to realize that that love is now present. You must affirm it. You receive not our testimony. If I have spoken to you earthly things and you believe not, how will you believe if I speak to you of heavenly things? I can take for you the example after example in the physical order of what is taking place in your life. Example, the story of the little butterfly. One time in Minnesota, my grandfather took his grandchild out around a lake. As they were going around the lake, 
all of a sudden a little boy saw a caterpillar on the tree limb. The little caterpillar's climbing there, and the boy said, Look, Grandpa, the caterpillar attaching himself to the limb. And Grandpa said, Watch. He cut the limb off, and they put it into a nice little terrarium. And the grandpa said, Now, I want you to watch this gift from God, this little caterpillar. It will make a cocoon. Don't touch the cocoon. So the grandpa gave the little young man, his little grandson, that caterpillar making a cocoon. The little boy watched the cocoon being made. It said, wow, it was neat. And then he let it go, just every now and then watched. All of a sudden he started seeing something was moving in the cocoon. He went to his mother and said, Mama, Mama, the cocoon is moving. The mother said, Ah, don't touch the cocoon. Watch it. Don't touch it. Ah, I watch it, Mom. Every day he watched it now and he saw that it was getting lighter. He could almost see through it at certain points. And he could see there's a little black head and that black head was pushing and, Mama, there's some bug or something inside of that cocoon. The mother smiled and said, just keep watching the cocoon. Don't touch the cocoon. All of a sudden he saw there were wings. And these wings were pushing and pushing and pushing and the head was stretching and stretching and stretching. The cocoon was going coo, 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 pushing in, out, in, out. Mommy, there's a butterfly in that cocoon. Yes, don't touch the cocoon and it will come out. Ah, the little boy was anxious. He saw the cocoon pushing. After a week, all of a sudden he saw the cocoon starting to break apart. He says, oh, I'll help it. He started to help it. And it opened up the cocoon and the butterfly came flying out, shoom, 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 and then <laughs> down to the ground. Mom! The butterfly came out of the cocoon and fell to the ground after flying just a little bit. What happened? You touched the cocoon. Uh, what do you mean I touched the cocoon? You touched the cocoon. Well, Mom, I was helping it. You didn't help it. What happens is this. In the cocoon, the butterfly's muscles are being pushed against the cocoon in order to give it the strength to be able to go out into the world and fly and give beauty. What happened? You began to open the cocoon and the cocoon, therefore, was not going to be strong enough to resist. And thus, the little butterfly pushed open too soon, came out, and now is dead. Simply because you thought you were helping it. Those of you of the Spirit understand what I'm saying from something of the earth, don't you? You know that every difficulty and struggle that you have is nothing more than inside of you, a, a, a soul that is struggling to say, I must be like Christ. I must be like Christ. I must gain that strength of Christ. So now you begin to realize if we talk of earthly things and you don't understand them, how are you going to understand if we start talking about the mystical spiritual life? So Nicodemus is on one level and here we are moving to a whole different level in the spiritual life of our own heart and soul. And no man has ascended into heaven but he that descended from heaven, the Son of Man who is in heaven. Is he using the past? He's speaking, Son of Man. 37 times he uses this term about himself, Son of Man. Do you understand that when he says Son of Man, he means all humanity? Because in him we live and move and have our being. In other words, Son of Man is, I am encapsulating all of you in my heart, and I will be offered up, you will be offered up in my death. In other words, there is a baptism that I must endure. And that baptism is a baptism of death. And unless I go through that baptism, which I yearn for, you will not live. Because you must die in me. 
And as Moses lifted up the serpent, here we go, back to the Old Testament, Exodus. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. What does that mean to Nicodemus? The Son of Man, humanity, must be lifted up. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, I know about the serpent in the desert, Nicodemus said. That was when the Israelites were griping and complaining against God. And God sent serpents to bite and kill. And the poison was killing the people. And he said, we have sinned against God. We have spoken against God. Intercede, Moses, for us. Take the serpents away. And God, listening to the intercession of Moses, one man, said, take your staff and have them make a bronze serpent. And anyone who looks upon your staff with that bronze serpent shall be healed of the snake bite. How many, you know, doctors that heal with a bronze serpent any snake bite? There's nothing in it. But it represents the Lord Jesus Christ who will look like sin, look like the serpent. He's placed upon the cross And you and I, with our sins and the poison of our sins, look upon him, and in that confessional, all of a sudden the blood, the antidote to our sin, to the poison of sin, flows down upon us, and hence, we're free. Anyone who looked upon that serpent of Moses was healed of the snake bite. These images that come to us from St. John are signs of the divine life invading the human condition. And that is why it's so important to take the exercises and say, take the scripture that we're reading now and look how we go back into the Old Testament to find out the fullness of its meaning and to have deeper inspiration for our prayer life. You get enthusiastic by it. When I came to these words, when I studied scripture, I said, I wish I could teach everybody these things. I wish I could teach you all the details of the Mass. So you, every Mass you go through, you say, wow, I learned something new even today. So there is no resting in the spiritual life. Non progredi, regredi est. i got to go forward. If I'm not going forward, I'm going backwards. And what causes us to go backwards more than anything else in our world is entertainment. That darn TV going constantly. My dad ended his life watching TV. I couldn't do anything about it. And I'm sure my mother will do the same. Entertainment. Look at the hospitals. What do they have? A doggone TV in every room. Why? To make the individual forget about the fact that I am mortal. I am going to die. Death is that which allows us freedom to live correctly. It's not something to be afraid of. And that is why every day, I don't think there's one day that I've passed I haven't thought about dying, about what it means, or spoken about it, or reflected upon it in the Holy Mass. I don't see how you can get away from it. And I hope and pray that when I do come to my deathbed, that I am at peace because... Our Lady said, if you proclaim these seven sorrows, you will find me at your deathbed. And that's what I want. I want to see Our Lady. And therefore, I make sure every day I meditate upon the seven sorrows of Our Lady. Promote those seven sorrows. Because one day, one soul that I may be able to help into heaven may say, Father, I did exactly what you said. I meditate upon the seven sorrows of Our Lady every day. And she's here. I see her. What a great consolation that would be to a priest. That whosoever believeth in him may not perish, but may have life everlasting. For God so loved the world as to give his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him may not perish, but may have life everlasting everlasting. For God sent not his Son into the world to judge the world, 
but that the world may be saved by him. What a beautiful expression of the intense love of God for your soul and my soul. God so loved. Now the word for love in Greek could be one of three. There is eros. You've heard erotic. Eros in the Greek is the attraction. You see your wife, your beautiful wives, and you were attracted to them. Think of the first time when they were young, vibrant, and everything else, and you thought, wow. Eros was the first experience, the come on to love. It's the attraction. Our Lord is not saying eros here. The second word for Greek in love is phileo. We know the city of Philadelphia is a city of brotherly love. Brotherly love is the second stage. You begin to date your wife. You begin to involve yourself in speaking to her. You begin to find out that, you know, I can tell her anything. I feel so uncomfortable. There's this brotherly relationship, brotherly sister relationship. Phileo. Is it God phileis this world? No. He didn't have a brotherly, sisterly relationship. In the Greek, reserved only for the highest of all is the word agapal, rarely used until the New Testament. Agapal is the word in which translated it's this way. I will love you in a divine, victimal, sacrificial way. I will give my life for you. I will lay down my life. No man could do it. How many men lay down their life for other men? You have it now because of the inspiration of our Lord Jesus Christ who said, what greater love might a man have than to give his own life for his brother, his sister, his neighbor. And so this divine love came into existence because our Lord Jesus Christ gave us the example. And so it is today. You're asked, sacrifice. Wednesday and Friday, I said to the cook, we're going to sacrifice on Wednesday and Friday. A little less. No meat. A little less in every way, shape and form. But just a little sacrifice. A little fast in your, in your retreat on Wednesday and Friday. Just that you might say, as a family here, we make reparation for the sins of abortion that we know have come into our world during this week. In fact, we have so many of our brothers and sisters in Washington crying out for life. And so we too will cry out for life by our little action of fasting, by our action of prayer, by our action of going out and seeing God's nature and saying as the trees, praise God, by their very nature, can't I with a will take all the trees, take all the people, take everything created and say, in me who have received the body, blood, soul and divinity of Jesus Christ from whom all things take their being. I, a simple creature, offer you, my Father in heaven, everything, everybody. Allow me not to condemn, criticize, gripe, complain, but rather to commend and to lift up all in your great love. And this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen.